pleasure to welcome Ricardo Dominguez uh, back to us. Uh, we've had various engagements with him over the years. Uh, Ricardo is um, in the visual arts, uh, where he serves as a professor at UC San Diego. His th theater group first developed virtual sitting technologies in solidarity with the Zapatista in Chiapas uh, in 1998. So he's been at this pretty much for 20 years in terms of these electronic interventions um, uh, and, and virtual activism. More recently, he and his partners developed the electronic uh, disturbance theater uh, 2.0 uh, at the Bang, B-A-N-G lab project and the transporter immigration tool, which uh, has some notoriety, a GPS cell phone safety, uh, safety net tool for crossing the Mexican-US uh, border, uh, which won the Transnational Communities Award in 2008. Um, it's funded by Cultural Contact, Endowment for Culture, uh, Mexico, US, um, Cal IT2, which is the uh, uh, UCSD, UCI um, a lab for uh, technology and telecommunications, um, and the UC San Diego Center for the Humanities. The Transport Immig Immigrant Tool has been exhibited at many international venues. Uh, the project was, its notoriety was under investigation in 2009 and 10 by the US Congress. It got heavily kind of trolled <laughs> um, by um, right-wing groups, was reviewed by um, Glenn Beck um, on radio and TV in 2010, when he still had himself some following, um, who said that it potentially dissolved the US border with poetry. Uh, we, should all, we should all be so lucky, right? Uh, Ricardo Dominguez will be talking about contra deportation, fighting injustice, with electronic civil disobedience. Please welcome Ricardo. Hola a todos a Pizzagate. Uh, muchas gracias a David y a Claudia y a toda la comunidad que me ha invitado a hablar ahora aquí. Uh, esta plática va a ser completamente en español. I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, what I like to do is um, uh, sort of set a stage as to how electronic civil disobedience was established uh, as a theory, uh, look at the way it was established as a practice, and then I'm going to try to focus on um, a couple of moments where we dealt with the issue of deportation uh, of immigrants and refugees from various countries, um, which of course includes our own. Uh, today, as you know, uh, is uh, the moment in which DACA recipients have to sign up, uh, re-sign up, and I think they have until March 5th uh, when the law will be uh, deleted to whatever degree it will be. Uh, so again, uh, within this condition of dreaming and dreamers, uh, I would like to um, give you a, a kind of sense of the performative matrix that uh, established electronic civil disobedience. Um, and I'll begin uh, just to give you a kind of singularity of myself, even though everything that I've always done has been collaborative. I've never done anything by myself. So if I say I, it is really we. I always work in the Anarchist Five, no more, no less, and I always work with artists. Uh, I was born in El Paso. Uh, Texas, so I'm an anchor baby, I suppose. Um, but I wasn't there very long. My family then moved to Las Vegas, uh, which again, uh, my heart goes out to the community that I grew up in. Um, and when I got to Las Vegas, uh, I think I was about six months old, I was very excited, and my family was very excited, not only by uh, what was mafia capitalism at that time, uh, military uh, structures. I think 98% of Nevada is military, right? The nuclear test site is 100 miles north of Las Vegas and Nellis Air Force. I think the second largest um, experimental um, uh, site for aircraft. 
and then, of course, Area 51 that doesn't exist. Uh, but the thing that was predominant for me in Las Vegas growing up uh, was uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, I don't know if any of you have been next to a nuclear bomb. Raise your hand. Uh, it's different than an earthquake. It's kind of oceanic. And um, every Saturday, as I was growing up, the sirens would go off, usually the first Saturday of the month, and we'd run out into the street and sort of enjoy the, the warmth of this bomb. One of the things that was interesting was it was very patriotic. My family and I and my mom would hang out and watch the bomb. Uh, we were told to duck and cover because that would protect us from the bomb. Uh, and, I, and I fully believe that. And one of the things that occurred was that uh, I would uh, be uh, influenced by the schizophrenic culture that was presented to me by nuclear power. And that is, on Saturday mornings, if I was lucky, 99 cent monster burger at the top of the Mint Hotel, I would go downstairs to the El Portal in Glitter Gulch, and I would see that nuclear bombs were going to create monsters. So as a young kid, I was rather confused. Um, I saw uh, that Las Vegas would be destroyed, uh, Danny Thomas would be destroyed. Um, so this particular moment uh, led uh, to the sort of investigation of the anti-nuclear movement that I became a part of, and I started seeing Najiprop Theater, uh, Bread and Puppet Theater, uh, Teatro Campesino, uh, the Living Theater, and I became very interested in how a performative gesture could develop and amplify uh, protest, if you will. Uh, I then uh, started working with downwind victims um, because the nuclear blasts were let off so that the wind would go into the four corner area rather than here to LA. So it was mostly indigenous community, Paiute, uh, polygamous, Mormons, and ranchers. And then I started working on MX impact statement. If you remember when Reagan came to power, he decided to uh, do a shell game with nuclear bombs until he had the vision of Star Wars. So I spent a lot of time trying to develop agiprop theater uh, to uh, see how communities felt about nuclear uh, power in that territory. I then decided to take a road trip uh, to Miami, Florida, because my family said, please leave the house now. Uh, it's important that you take off. And my car broke down in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, I was lucky enough to break down in front of a lesbian bookstore called Ruby Fruit Books after Rena Mae Brown's uh, famous novel, Ruby Fruit Jungle. Uh, they were kind to me, and they gave me a three-day uh, uh, a week job being a book buyer. And I began to encounter a lot of uh, community there in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, and part of that community uh, was this group of young artists uh, that we became critical art ensemble. Uh, Steve Barnes, who was the first person we had ever encountered that had touched a computer, and he hated computers. Next to him is Dorian Burr. She was a photographer, and she hated photography. Uh, next to uh, her was myself. I was a performance artist who hated performance art. Uh, next to her, me was Hope Kurtz, who was a poet who hated poetry. And next to her is uh, Steve Kurtz, who was a filmmaker. You guessed it, he hated film. So you could see that we were united in a general hatred of things. Um, but we decided that we would develop radical gestures in the cultural frontier of Tallahassee, Florida. And we made a spit bond that we would spend 10 years together developing our work. Every gesture I have ever done always takes 10 years, from concept to gesture to reflection. So one of the things that we started investigating at this period was this idea of cyberpunk that was emerging in the early 80s, the idea that data bodies and real bodies would become a predominant space for a new kind of virtual capitalism that was going to be rolled out. And so we imagined in the future of the 90s that the battle would be between data bodies and real bodies. We felt that data bodies would be the predominant uh, predator. That is, our real bodies, no matter how much soul we have, no matter how much our, our love our mother gave us, would not uh, be the judge uh, in terms of our qualities. It would be virtual capitalism judging our data body. 
our levels of debt, credit, what have you. So we started to think about how data bodies and real bodies uh, developed uh, in this, what we call the performative matrix, and we began to investigate, remember we don't have computers here in the early 80s, what was uh, something that would promote a data body over a real body. And so that was um, malls. Malls were fairly new to us, and so we decided to examine what malls were. They were privatized, public-looking uh, living spaces. That is, they pretended to be public, but they were privatized. So uh, influenced by Augusto Boal's Invisible Theater and Theater of the Oppressed, I developed what I call micro-gestures. These were gestures that didn't protest, uh, that didn't say something was wrong. Uh, they would just create a space where a community would gather and speak to one another about what might be happening. And so this was my, my first gesture, uh, this micro gesture at the Tallahassee Mall. Like a good commodity fetishist, I went into the mall, bought my commodities, but I couldn't wait to do what a proper commodity fetishist does, and that is to go home and open them in the back room privately. I just broke my commodities right there on the sidewalk. Very soon, security forces showed up. Community talked, is this a Vietnam vet? Is this a, a drug addict? Is this a person uh, with certain issues? I would say nothing, uh, but they would uh, have many conversations. Uh, eventually, they would try to arrest me, and I'd just pack up my things and go away. So this microgesture is something that I repeat over and over in the work. It's sort of like Hamlet's uh, uh, mousetrap. It creates a space in which power plays itself out. Again, I'm just showing these kind of moments uh, so that you understand how electronic civil disobedience came to be. Another thing we were doing in 83, 84 was what we call uh, utopian plagiarism. Now all of you tell your students, don't plagiarize, you're going to be arrested. We say plagiarize. And one of the things that we did was just shift a few words uh, and often when the FBI come to my door and say, you guys are using poetry and art as camouflage, I said, you can't love poetry uh, so uh, as much as we do. These are handmade poetry books that we would do on the weekend. So how does utopian plagiarism work? I was reading uh, Henry David Thoreau, 1848, uh, on civil disobedience, his protest against the Mexican-American War, which he believed was about the expansion of the southern states' uh, enslavement economy into Mexico. He called for our bodies to uh, throw themselves into the machine. And so what we did was just put electronic in front of civil disobedience. And there Thoreau spoke about electronic civil disobedience, trespass and blockage for a higher law against uh, the economies of enslavement. So we started thinking very quickly, writing very quickly about electronic civil disobedience, but then our theories had to hit the ground because by the mid 80s, our friends began to die of a certain disease that was unknown. We didn't know what it was. Uh, later on, it was HIV AIDS. Uh, Reagan and the therapeutic state was using AZT. It was killing more of our community than uh, even the unknown disease. So we started ACT UP, uh, Tallahassee AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. Uh, that was originally started by Larry Kramer, uh, 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 a theater artist and uh, playwright. And we worked with ACT UP Miami and ACT UP Atlanta. And we started doing what are called community research initiative actions, which were number one, to use electronic civil disobedience against the therapeutic state, to, uh, against insurance companies, and against uh, Reaganism uh, in the way it was playing itself out. So we did uh, uh, on the ground actions, of course, posters, information pamphlets, and also developing what is called now citizen science. If you've seen the Dallas Buyers Club, we would develop our own drugs in order to uh, uh, route around uh, what was not working. The other thing that we started doing was fax jams and call jams. This was the first instance of, for us, was electronic civil disobedience. So, for instance, uh, one day Publix, which is a very large kind of Whole Foods space in southern uh, in the southern states, decided they were going to they weren't going to sell condoms as their response to HIV/AIDS. We at Act Up Tallahassee felt this was not a good idea. 
So our choice was we could slam them hard, do a fax jam, you know, we hate you, a call jam, you're evil, or we could be good consumers and say, we love your store, we want to buy condoms in your store, we at ACT UP, what have you, and we would call them 24 hours a day and fax jam them, fax jam them with our love. Publix then, after two weeks, responded and said, ACT UP Tallahassee, we're going to sell condoms in our store. We said, yay, can you put them up front? Because we're in a hurry and we don't want to have to go all the way to the back. <laughs> you know how we are. Anyway, so they did it. And out of that came utopian plagiarism and our first actions uh, around um, uh, HIV. And we rapidly wrote a series of books, if you read them, online. Uh, they're not copy left or copyright, they're copy riot. Uh, and we had a name, Critical Art Ensemble. And the idea was electronic disturbance, that we needed to develop actions for the 90s as virtual capitalism was going to be integrated and rolled out to hit virtual capitalism through trespass and blockage using the same histories of nonviolent direct action from Henry David Thoreau uh, to Gandhi to the Civil Rights Movement to ACT UP to uh, any other group that you can think within this territory, only it would be a digital uh, action in which data bodies would gather with real bodies. Um, then we wrote electronic civil disobedience again using the idea of utopian plagiarism. So by the end of the 80s, we had come up with a theory, we had come up with a, a, a practice, and we had thought about how it might be embedded within certain communities. Um, we broke up at that time because, again, our spit of 10 years had, is over. Uh, I took on electronic civil disobedience to put it into practice. That is, I needed to find computers because we didn't have any. Uh, the other members went up to uh, uh, start investigating bio art to uh, you know, sort of stop what we call genetic capitalism. And then uh, another group started looking at nanotoxicology or particle capitalism. That would be the last stage of the 90s. So I went to New York City and started an internet service provider uh, with another artist named Wolfgang Stela because we needed our own infrastructure. And if you remember, in 1991, there was no browsers. It was all BBS and Moose. So uh, very quickly, between 1991 and 1994, we established La Cosa in Argentina, uh, Thing Amsterdam, Thing Vienna, Thing Berlin, uh, Thing Cuba, La Cosa Cuba. And so it was a very rapid network of self-training in the space of digital culture. The other thing that happened was in 1991, I started reading the military, especially the RAND Corporation. In 1991, the RAND Corporation, Ron Felt and Aquila, wrote an essay called Cyber War is Coming. And they said, cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime is coming. And it was a prayer because they thought it would have a, a lot of capital would be built around these things. And they said, uh, cyber terrorism, cyber crime, cyber war needs three things. It needs infrastructure, that is electricity, telephony, connectivity, and servers. Two, it needs syntactical knowledge. Uh, that is, you need people who know how to run software. And one, you need people who have semantic control, which means you just need to speak the language of empire, English. So you need those three things. And I thought, you know, they never mention electronic civil disobedience. Perhaps I'll hit the RAND Corporation and do a pedagogical action to begin to shift the discursive regime that disallows electronic civil disobedience in this conversation. And of course, I, being an artist, would use cyber poetics. Well, originally the idea, based on the 80s uh, theorization, would be that it would be a cadre of anonymous uh, technocentric individuals who would develop electronic civil disobedience. It wouldn't be the activists in the street because they're Luddites. They don't like machines for good reason. Uh, it wouldn't be hackers because they only believe in the politics of code qua code. They're not interested in the streets. They're only interested in that. So it had to be artists, of course. <clears throat> So uh, again, but it was a highly anonymous system. 
The other thing was I noticed in the early days of internet culture that anonymity was the way it was being sold, right? AOL said, in cyberspace, nobody knows you're a cat. Nobody knows you're a dog. That was the power of this space. So uh, I was moving in that direction, anonymity. I was doing secrecy, right? Direct digital action against these machines. But then something happened, sort of like ACT UP. And that was one minute after midnight, 1994. The Zapatistas emerged in southernmost Chiapas. And within six hours, they became the largest network for social struggle that had ever been created. And they did not speak English. They did not even speak Spanish. They did not have computers. They did not have electricity. Yet they were able to create what they called the electronic fabric of cyber zapatismo. To me, this was a revelation. Here was a group of indigenous who had absolutely nothing. Within six hours, they created what the New York Times calls the first postmodern revolution. And I always ask my researchers, you know, you have all these computers, you have six hours to create a global network of struggle and resistance. And they go, oh, Professor, we can't do that. I would say the Zapatistas did it. Why can't you? So I started working with them. The Zapatistas uh, taught me Mayan technology. I started developing early browsers. Now, what's interesting about 1994 is, remember, Mosaic, the first browser, came about on April 1993. The Zapatistas emerged January 1st, 1994, at the same time as NAFTA, the free trade organization and contract between Canada, the US, and Mexico. And also, the Zapatistas use a word I had never heard before. They call it neoliberalism. Neoliberalism is coming to delete their rights as human beings. And basically, uh, they began to train me. The next day, January 2nd, I became uh, 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 part of the New York Committee for Democracy in Mexico, the New York Zapatistas, and started using hot links, images, as a site for thinking a new cyber poetics. And I felt they were going to be the key for developing electronic civil disobedience. I started teaching uh, in the streets about Mayan technology, uh, specifically in communication with children. I started doing hunger strikes with the New York Committee and Democracy in Mexico. Again, very formal uh, activist-like work on the ground. But in my head, the Zapatistas were saying, go digital. And so that's what I was focusing on. Uh, I then did a show at MIT called uh, Rabin Alaki Zapatista Port Action in 1996. Uh, at the same time that Zapatistas came to New York, and I introduced them to the idea of electronic civil disobedience. Using early See You, See Me, I would do performances of the only Mayan play that we have, and do chat. I don't know if you guys ever used See You, See Me. It was uh, the version of uh, Skype in those days, size of a postage stamp. You go, can you see me? Can I, I can't see you. Can you see me? We do the same thing. So I used this, and for a year, I communicated with the Digital Zapatista Network all over the world. And out of this came a conversation with an artist, Brett Stahlbaum, uh, in Southern California. My system administrator, uh, Carmen Karasik, who was a bug hunter, uh, who had never heard of the Zapatistas, but was doing the servers at MIT, and Stefan war and drug war in Mexico, and we started uh, Electronic Disturbance Theater, um, working with the Zapatistas. Very quickly, we launched what was the first virtual sit-in technology, and we hit the front pages of the New York Times. This is what the uh, uh, interface looks like uh, using Netscape at this particular time. Uh, one of the things is that uh, the idea was that it would use the public agora of uh, the browser, the refresh reload button, right? You go to some space, you've read yesterday's news, it's still there, you hit refresh reload. Just remember like Neo, the second part, reload. Uh, and uh, so that the, the virtual sit-in would count how many people were joining, right? It, if one person joined, then it was only one person. If 100,000 people joined, then it would hit the refresh reload button over and over. 
The idea it would disturb uh, the Mexican government website, the U.S. government websites, and the Canadian government websites built around NAFTA. The other thing that we did was called 404 files. I was a net artist and there was a long history of 404, that is files not found. What we would do is uh, uh, artists would upload crazy things like Smelly Duck Ballet Part 2 at the New York Times. New York Times would say, Smelly Duck Ballet 2 uh, is not found, it's missing. But what we did is we used it against the Mexican government and other governments. That is, we would upload justice into the system and the Mexican government would say justice is not found on this government website. We would go to the uh, President Clinton's website, democracy, democracy is not found. Uh, we would go to the Pentagon and they would, so we weren't leaking what was secret in the system. We weren't trying to crack into the system. We were just using uh, a face that would show what does not exist in the system that is part of the public agora. And they got very angry at us. And uh, I'll show you a video that will sort of replay this and then we'll move into uh, actions around uh, how this was used for the purposes of actions around deportation. <laughs> It was in the hills of Chiapas in 1994 that the first shots were fired in the information war. Despite being without phones or electricity, Mexico's Zapatista rebels took the revolution online, issuing a call to arms across the internet for others to join them in a worldwide struggle against economic imperialism. Ricardo Dominguez and his electronic disturbance theatre were among the first to heed the call. I came to New York in 1991. What I was looking for was a platform that would allow me to create uh, a space for electronic civil disobedience. Ricardo Dominguez, electronic disturbance theatre, New York. Digital Zapatista. Electronic civil disobedience is non-violent direct action online. It follows the theory of uh, Thoreau and on civil disobedience that was then developed by Gandhi, Martin Luther King, ACT UP during the 80s, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. We never destroy a server. Uh, we never change anybody's web page. We never uh, hijack their uh, name or domain name. In 1998, Electronic Disturbance Theater releases Floodnet, the first automated virtual sit-in software with actions against the Mexican president's website, several Mexican banks, Frankfurt Stock Exchange, and even tries attacking the Pentagon. At one point, the Pentagon fires back with hostile Java applets, crashing the attacker's system. By creating the idea of electronic disturbance, Ricardo found a way to mix his passion for politics and performance with a dash of magic realism and turn it into code. Really, uh, what is a Zapatista is those who can uh, take into their heart the poetic gestures. 
the, the gestures of information war, which uh, cross the boundaries of what is. For instance, on January 3rd, 2000, uh, newspapers around the world had Zapatista Air Force attacks Mexican military. Nobody knew the Zapatistas even had planes. Nobody even knew the Zapatistas could fly. But if you read the story, suddenly you discover that these uh, Zapatista Air, uh, Air Force were paper airplanes made of many different colors. Inside were messages of peace. So what the soldiers were shooting at were these paper airplanes. And there you have this enactment of a simulation of a gesture which creates this magical space uh, where indeed there does exist a Zapatista Air Force. Because what you're trying to get out is what the Zapatistas say is information war. That is, words as war, not words for war. Inspired by... So one of the other important elements of, about this was that we decided very early on, and it was very difficult for us. Um, let's see, where did my um, lovely... Um, can you bring it up? Yeah. So one of the things that we decided, remember that Zapatista's we theorized ideas. data bodies and, and real bodies, uh, was that we went against anonymity. And this was hard for uh, us at Electronic Disturbance Theater. Yeah, that's fine. Um, was that we would follow it, uh, the aesthetics of transparency. So when we started doing this, we told everybody, this, uh, our data body and real body are together, as Gandhi said, satyagraha. That is, when you do a protest, you want the police uh, to see you. You want communities to see you. That is, uh, you have to be willing to take a beating uh, in order to uh, accentuate satyagraha, your spirit and your body. So what we would do is we would announce weeks ahead of time, I'm Ricardo Dominguez, Stefan Ray, Carmen Karasik, uh, Brett Stahlbaum, I'm living in uh, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. This is my address, my telephone number. The code is nothing but HTML. You can do view source. There's nothing hidden about this. So they became very confused, right? Because they wanted everything to be secret, encrypted. Everything was about technological efficiency and not symbolic efficacy. Um, so uh, they launched the first known information war weapon at us. Uh, and everybody knew they had them. And if you remember the first micro gesture I did where the security guard comes and says, what's going on here? Well, the Department of Defense was like that security guard coming in and saying, what's going on with their weapons? Uh, the next day, um, we were on the front page of the New York Times. Uh, they gave us the best review we ever had. The electronic disturbance theater wasn't illegal. It was certainly immoral. So one of the things about cyber poetics is it shifts the conditions of technological efficiency, which is bound to the rule of law, their law, to the question of aesthetics and justice. So once they start speaking about morality, they're speaking about ethics. And so this then created a series of encounters. Uh, the NSA invited us to come down and do a performance for them. Have you guys ever done a performance for the NSA? Well, you're doing it all the time on your computers, right? Uh, but we actually went down there. Uh, it was very interesting, another story. But what came out of that was that we were able to convince two people uh, that we were not doing cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime. Dr. Dorothy Denning, the head of information war for the Clinton White House, she was uh, naval intelligence and, and uh, she presented before the House Arms Committee on cyber terrorism, cyber war, cyber crime, that electronic disturbance theater was electronic civil disobedience equivalent to the Million Mothers March. So that was before Congress. We then convinced a right-wing information war warrior who then became part of the Bush system named Wynn Schwartow, and he wrote a book called uh, Cyber war, Cybershock, and uh, in it he has an essay called uh, uh, Electronic Disturbance Theater versus the Pentagon, and he comes down on our side. So at least we were able to convince two people, if not the NSA. So uh, this is a nice quote. Uh, we're literally dispatches from the future. Uh, I like imagining ourselves like the Zapatistas from the future. All right, uh, now I'll move into what does this have to do with deportation? So 
Uh, in 2000, Electronic Disturbance Theater is invited to Tijuana to join the border hack uh, and to do a hack of the border. And it was our first time of shooting data bodies from the south to the north instead of from the north in support of the south. And what we did, uh, we looked at the servers of the uh, U.S. Uh, Custom and Border Patrol, and we did port scans. As you know, computers have multiple ports, right? And if you scan them, usually they say you're trying to crack into the system. But what we did to the Border Patrol servers is every time we found an open port, we would shoot us up at least a poem in there or a poem about immigrants and refugees. They got very angry, but they could only get angry about the quality of poetry uh, and the quality of aesthetics. Um, and then, after this, I was contacted by a group uh, that came out of Document 10, the No Borders Group, also, no, also called No One is Illegal. And they uh, contacted me because uh, the German government and Lufthansa had developed a hybrid private deportation system. They would use public airlines to uh, deport people. They would mummify them in the back uh, and put uh, motorcycle masks on them. And started in 1991 and 1999, a number of them began to die because they were asphyxiated in the back. Uh, and so uh, the no, uh, no Borders Group and uh, No One is Illegal asked uh, Electronic Disturbance Theater to come to Germany and train them to do a virtual sit-in against Lufthansa to stop this private uh, government uh, deportation process. Uh, and so we started developing uh, a transparent gesture uh, with uh, lots of different ads. So I traveled. Um, uh, speaking to different groups that were going to join us. One was the Chaos Computer Club, a very important uh, hacker group that never wanted to speak to Electronic Disturbance Theater because they said we were pure evil. We were trying to teleport the history of street politics into the virtual highway, if you will. And they said there's virtual world and there's real world and they do not meet. So you guys are pure evil. We said, yes, we are digitally incorrect. We are trying to connect both uh, units. So it was interesting to see a young group of Chaos Computer Club join us, as opposed to the older group. And this, to me, gave me some indication of what perhaps Anonymous would be much later in the decade uh, to come. The other group that joined us was the Libertad group, which were a 1968 prison abolitionist movement, as well as a conceptual artist from Cologne. And the conceptual artist started developing this deportation class action style. They dressed like stewards and uh, pilots, and they would go into Lufthansa stations and hand out information gifts, if you will, about all this. We said we would shut them down in 30 days, and we would also take over the stockholders meeting. Uh, and I went around uh, uh, Germany speaking about the use of transparency. Uh, here are some of the posters that were developed. They were all over Germany. We put them in newspapers. Uh, we did dance parties. <clears throat> Uh, I would speak to community groups. And one of the uh, uh, funny things was that uh, one time I went to this town in Germany and they said, Ricardo, welcome. Uh, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning and they said, in this town the beer is so good that during World War II the Russians, the Nazis, and the uh, Allies said you cannot bomb it because the beer is so good. You must drink the beer. I said, OK, I don't drink, but I don't want to be like a bad tourist, so I'll have a stein. It's like 11 o'clock in the morning, and the steins are big. I drink about half, and I'm already like loopy, as can possibly be. And then they go, Ricardo, you're going to be on national TV in, uh, in just an hour with the head of cybersecurity for Germany and the vice president of Lufthansa. It's a big news show, uh, I guess like Charlie Rose or Ted Koppel. 
And so I'm going, great, you guys should have told me I'm now drunk. So I'm on this show, and it's in German. My Deutsch is not great. And finally, uh, they're talking about the action. And finally, the newspaper guy, uh, interviewer, turns to me and says, Ricardo Dominguez, hacktivist, electronic civil disobedience, real or virtual? Whoa. Uh, really virtual and virtually real. Ah, yeah. Really virtual and virtually real. That's all I said, and it seemed to work. So thank you, German Stein. So what happens was that we were able then to uh, indeed uh, do a virtual sit-in against uh, uh, Lufthansa. The deportation class people walked into the stockholders' uh, meeting. Uh, we were able to force um, both the uh, pilots and the stewards union to sign that they would never do another deportation class uh, action, and the stockholders also rejected uh, doing uh, uh, taking money from the German government. So one of the things that uh, really worked uh, was this 30 days of being transparent. Uh, the code was not secret. I'm going to see if I can show you uh, a bit of the code here before I go into um, what happened. Is my browser up? Can you bring the browser up? Did you shut it down? No. My little helper. Okay, can you put in, uh, uh, is that me? Do I have it here? Okay. Uh, let's see, rhizome. There it is. So I'm just going to show you what we used against Lufthansa. So this is a simulated site. This is the way Netscape, remember Netscape? So for instance, I'm going to upload a personal message to the Mexican uh, bank here. I'm going to say justice. I don't know if I spelt it correctly. I can't see. And so you see justice not found. So we did this against uh, Lufthansa. And then you could also see as you joined how many people were participating. We had about 17,000 people join the virtual sit-in. Again, data bodies and real bodies uh, connecting to one another in a transparent way. There was nothing encrypted. If you'll bring up the, um, uh, uh, the um, a PowerPoint again for me. Um, so again, uploading 404 files, thank you. Yeah. So one of the things that happened, everything went well. Uh, we uh, moved forward uh, with the action, congratulated ourselves. Then two years later, the administrator of the server on which we did the virtual sit-in, Andreas Thomas Vogel, uh, his home and office from Libertad de E, they were a prison abolitionist group, was raided by uh, cyber uh, police and uh, cyber uh, or terrorist uh, 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 officials. And he was accused of doing cyber terrorism against uh, Lufthansa. He was arrested, put uh, on trial, and uh, he was going to end up having to pay uh, spend time in jail, and so we did uh, another campaign saying no. This was electronic civil disobedience, and the lower court said no. Uh, this was cyber terrorism, cyber war, cyber crime. He's going to have to do his time. He's going to have to pay. Uh, we then decided to do a virtual sit-in against the court, right, because we didn't agree. Uh, then, uh, basically, what happened was the higher court of Frankfurt overturned the lower court of Frankfurt, uh, and they said uh, the court recognized that the, in the Vogel case, and in the reasoning uh, is exemplary, a higher court overturned the verdict, finding the online demonstration did not constitute a show of force, but was intended to influence public opinion. 
Libertad responded to the ruling with a statement, although it is a virtual in nature, the internet is still a real public space. Wherever dirty deals go down, protests have to, uh, also have to be possible. So that is one of the kind of key moments for electronic civil disobedience in that we had an international court, uh, German, uh, amplifying to the degree that there is a difference between cyber war, cyber terrorism, cyber crime. Uh, and again, that it was built around this issue of a growing global uh, condition and policy of borderization as globalization, and part of that is deportation. I then started working with uh, Anonymous during the early days, teaching electronic civil disobedience in schools, teaching contestational robotics, uh, and we started doing uh, early drones uh, to help uh, individuals cross uh, the U.S. border. Uh, it was called Swarm the Minutemen. The Minutemen were a group of uh, racists uh, who wanted to stop refugees, and we developed drones that would uh, make loud noises uh, because the uh, Minutemen said they loved the silence of the desert because they can hear the rats crossing the border. And so we thought if we played uh, Nortec for them, played some good m border music for them, they couldn't hear what was happening. Uh, contestational robots. And then I was hired to do electronic civil disobedience hacktivism, border disturbance art, and nanopoetics, nanotoxicology in 2004. So don't let, don't let your mom tell you that causing trouble doesn't get you a job. Uh, they said uh, here in uh, Tala in San Diego, you'll be able to investigate Tierra, Liberación y Revolución. And I said, I can use the UC supercomputers against anybody I want, including you. And they said, yes, Ricardo, that sounds good. I'm going to develop border disturbance tools that will be used against uh, nation states uh, including the U.S., and said, yes, Ricardo, that sounds good. I don't think they believed me. So I started investigating the border. Uh, border art has existed a long time. Uh, this is the first major piece of known border art, 1988, Richard Liu's door. He handed keys to people in Tijuana so he could cross the border. Uh, I began to investigate in 2007 the idea that the state, uh, that the border is a state-sponsored aesthetic project. This made it easier for me. I began to think of the border as earth art, not as the objection machine that we know, the political military machine, but I thought as an artist it would be easier to approach it as an art uh, site. Um, I was reading Mary Pat Brady. The other thing I did was I began to investigate the nature of the border, the virtual border. And I discovered that San Diego is at the core of the history of the virtual border. Uh, during the Vietnam War, 1968 to about 1973, uh, the DARPA organization hired uh, and brought together what they said were the geniuses of the nation. They were called the Jasons and they were asked to develop a virtual system that would stop the Vietnamese troops, the Viet Cong, from moving south. Uh, and so working with IBM, they developed the lily pad system where they would drop sensors, uh, chemical sensors, sound sensors. If you saw the recent King Kong movie, uh, you saw them dropping sensors on the ground. Uh, and what they did is this information would be caught by air radar planes flying over the, uh, the border and picking up the information. But very soon, the Vietnamese uh, army discovered they could just put buckets of piss next to the chemical sensors. The lily pads of IBM would say, here are the Vietnamese. They would bomb that area, and then the Vietnamese would just go around uh, the area. So I, again, I thought electronic disturbance and a border project could be the equivalent of a bucket of piss that no matter what the military state, any border around the world, there would always be a way to disturb it. And no matter how well hidden their surveillance systems were, no matter how high their walls were, here's my first piece I did. I just went to the border, 
with my UCSD professor shirt, looking at the Pacific Rim, looking at the future, standing by the, uh, by the border wall, uh, and then five minutes, just like the original micro gesture, Border Patrol showed up and they said, you cannot stand and be happy at the border. You must move along. So I knew it wouldn't be very hard to disturb the border and to begin to help those that are being deported re-immigrate back into the nation. Perhaps I could use a cannon, but that seemed rather big. I don't think I could offer cannons to everybody. I like this by the artist, uh, uh, the Argentinian artist, Judy Werther, uh, Brinco. She would give uh, these shoes at the border, and if you crossed over, you could call her and she would come give you $250 for the shoes. Uh, if you read Fox News and their hate of the transport immigrant tool, um, it was the same. Then in 2007, we developed the transport immigrant tool, uh, working with NGOs, uh, uh, Border Angels and Water Station Inc. in Southern uh, California in the Anza Borrego area. This tool would allow you to navigate, find water. Uh, this is the group that worked on it. Uh, also importantly, uh, Brett Stahlbaum, uh, Amy Sarah Carroll, who developed the poetry, because I wanted to go from the global positioning system territory, locative media, because I knew the FBI and others could arrest you for using global positioning systems. And so with poetry, we could shift it to a geopoetic system, uh, which really made the FBI angry. Uh, over there is uh, Ellie Mermad, right above me. She is a sound artist from Iran. Uh, she's a Farsi underground trombonist. And she took this iMotorola phone that had absolutely no power and compressed dozens of poems into it. She's a genius. Next to her is uh, Misha Cardenas, Mex reality artist, who began to think about the question of trans, trans body and trans technologies. Uh, Brett Stahlbaum developed walking tools, which is the base code. Uh, uh, the book we wrote about it, The Trans Reel. Uh, there's Ellie playing jazz. Uh, Amy Sarah Carroll, her new book, Remax, on NAFTA and art. Uh, and then we move from global positioning to geopoetic system, uh, developed the tool through funding. It also had a water witching element because say the survival poetry and the little damn screen, if you're in the middle of the desert, couldn't help you, it would vibrate if you were getting closer in the direction of water, like the old water witching tool. Uh, it also had poetry that the FBI really hated Female, male, female, male, male, female, male, female, 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 male, female, female, male, 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 female, female, male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female, 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 male, female, female, male, male, female, male, female, male, female, male, female, 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 Turn off the sound. Female male, female male, female male, female male, female female, female male, female female male, female female male, female male, male, female female male, female male, female male, female male, female male, female male, male, female male, female female, female male, female female, female male. That's what poetry does. So, um, one of the things that occurred was, in the end, my university tried to detenure me. Uh, Congress called us traitors to the nation, and the FBI started a cyber terrorism, cyber war uh, analysis of us, and they ended up having to read poetry instead of arrest us. And in the end, they said, uh, is, is this poetry encrypted? We said, all poetry is encrypted. <laughs> I've read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland many years. I still don't know. I have read Shakespeare's sonnets. Is he in love with himself or someone else? I don't know. Uh, so uh, the tool uh, continued its development, working with these different groups. Um, uh, and um, uh, we did ads all over uh, the US uh, and in Mexico, newspaper ads. And as uh, you know, Glenn Beck said, there are three great evils in the world. Uh, Iran, North Korea, and the transporter immigrant tool. And the most evil of all is the transporter immigrant tool. 
uh, because it will dissolve the border with its poetry. Um, we have books that we've uh, given out. The code is available for anybody who wants it at walkingtools.net. And as you know, poetry is now illegal. Uh, I was defended by a lot of students and community and uh, UCI as well. I'll stop and maybe you can ask me some questions. Yeah. Or you can get more pizza. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I started uh, analyzing drones. Uh, I'm at uh, researcher, principal investigator at Cal IT2 now, California Information Technology 2. General Atomics is right across the street. And my institution produces all the technology that goes into the Predator drone, into the Gorgon, which is being used in various ways, uh, whether it's on the border or away. So uh, we did a three-year project that started uh, in 2012. Uh, and I started developing uh, uh, signage with my students to demarcate where uh, our university has um, drone technology. Uh, working with artist Alex Rivera, we made a human drone that we, uh, with bones of the dead that had been killed and the names of the dead, and we flew it over General Atomics, and they felt quite angry because they didn't feel they were involved in any of that kind of site of destruction. Uh, the other thing uh, that we did uh, was that I started a, a project called the Palindrone. Uh, which will be a predator uh, that will fly the U.S.-Mexico border because the palindrome is the same backwards as it is forwards, like the border. Uh, the uh, palindrome is a singing border drone that will sing to the Homeland Security drones, the, you know, the remote pilots at Critch, Nevada, and sing to them the music of uh, Gloria Ansaldúa, the corridos, because they might not know the border culture, if you will, so right now we're in the process of, uh, of sort of uh, designing it. Uh, we have the basic core design. Uh, we're analyzing. Here's a, a drone that crashed at uh, UCSD. I'm now the head of the UC Center for Drone Policy and Ethics. Um, so uh, yes, this, so right now I'm on about year four and a half year five, uh, we've constructed the, the drone, about a third of the size. Right now, what we have to analyze is the signaling procedures to share uh, with them. So since we don't exactly know what their signal range is, it's going to have to go through various layers. Uh, we're going to have to build it on a solar wingspan so they can just continuously go back and forth um, we have to uh, curate the poetry and music and what have you. Uh, so if all goes well, maybe in another two years, it will be, uh, the gesture will concretize, and then I'll have another three years to think about what it meant, right? So, yes? So, uh, not too much projectile, but mm -hmm. what other uh, anti-drone attacks or techniques have you seen up against the United States? Well, I mean, there's certainly a lot of research being done by hobbyists and, and military about how to take down drones from using your local eagles and, and seagulls, right, uh, to strange kind of anti-radar uh, son uh, sonification systems, right, that sort of break the uh, control, the wireless remote control. Uh, there's been some people at University of Texas at Austin, maybe about four years ago now, who actually cracked into the uh, uh, predator or predator-like entity and brought it down. But again, uh, we're not particularly interested in, in that level of disturbance. But again, sharing a kind of poetic sensibility. Uh -huh. 
Right. Well, uh, again, we've already evaluated what it means to crash drones, right? Uh, so uh, uh, drones, uh, dronology is bound to crashology. Uh, so if, uh, if that drone crashes, then I would imagine it's part of the uh, general gesture, and we could reflect on what that might mean. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like any of it could be like they launch information war weapons at us, like the Department of Defense did. Uh, and what happened in that case was the Harvard School of Electronic Law and Policy said, Ricardo, do you guys want to sue the Department of Defense because they broke the posse comitatus of, you know, uh, 1878 launching against uh, a server in New York? And we're going, huh, well, that might be an interesting end to our project, a court trial. You know, it's good for theater. Uh, but we changed our mind uh, about how to end the performance. So if they do that, that will just allow, again, this micro gesture where power, uh, where you don't have to go look at how, how mean power can be. They'll just do it for you uh, along the way. So part of the performative matrix. Yes. Oh, gosh. In my, well, I'm a, right now I'm a fellow at the Society for Humanities at Cornell. Uh, so I get to spend my time with a lot of really, really smart PhDs who are writing uh, books. And the theme this year is corruption. Uh, so I'm looking at the way that my work as a, always collaboratively uh, corrupts the romance of the unique genius uh, uh, artist. Uh, I always work uh, corrupting that vision. Uh, and so is there a positivity to corruption uh, in corrupting the idea of the singular figure uh, as opposed to the collective uh, figure. And one of the members of Electronic Disturbance Theater, Amy Sarah Carroll, is also a fellow this year. So we're collaborating, uh, which is the first time, as we understand, in the long history of the Society for the Humanities, where you had people collaborating, and not specifically on a text or a, or a book-like object, but in a gesture, if you will. So that's... Uh, yeah, and then uh, I did, I moved the set. My son was in, um, he's 11 years old, and he just finished doing a rotating production of Midsummer Night's Dream as Puck. And he was in The Tempest as Stefano, because he wanted to play a drunkard. And so I, I he did excellent productions, and I did stagehand, moving sets. Uh, so that's what I do in my spare time, uh, move sets. So theater is an important part of everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then go on to give a really stark picture mm -hmm. of, um, of, of online sort of antisocial behavior. Mm -hmm. And I'm left really scared that for every activist with a poetic vision, there, there, there are going to be thousands of white supremacist hackers uh, using the internet uh, you know, to work that way. Well, I would say that our entire history as a nation has always been, you know, a lot of white supremacists, enslavement economies. Uh, you know, I, I think I always think of William Burroughs saying, the United States was bounded and founded by evil even before the indigenous communities came. So, there, there, you know, evil and badness is always around. Uh, you know, uh, but I do believe that there is an arc uh, of justice, of communities. Um, we may not always agree with each other. For instance, the transport immigrant tool, we had to work with an NGO, Water Station Inc., who we could, we could not agree on any political thing at all other than Christ had told them that a person should not die in the desert, right? And so I call this relational non-relationality. They, 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 you know, don't, uh, they hate us, right? You guys are communist, right? You guys have poetry. You guys are weird. But in the end, after working with us for two or three years, the tool worked. 
The poetry offered spiritual sustenance, survival sustenance, and we could agree, whether we were communist or Christians, that people shouldn't die in the desert. And so that, I think we have to uh, connect with that relational non-relationality, that incommensurable community, and, and let not hope die in our paranoia, which is good to have, right? It's like our, our four mothers and forefathers, uh, the Yippies and uh, SDS and the Black Panthers were being driven insane by the FBI. And then COINTELPRO came along and we knew they were being driven insane. So as activists, as artivists, as whatever, we can say, yes, they're out there. They're spying, they're causing havoc, chaosmosis, but uh, uh, that doesn't mean you should stop uh, that grain of, of, of teaching, that grain of seeing that there might be something there that is not necessarily bound by the abyss. Um, and so I tend to be of the, yes, there's black hats and there's white hats. I'm a red hat uh, because I like the color. I don't know. So, you know, yes, there's a lot to be worried about, but I think there's also a lot in our history and in this com moment of post-contemporary culture, that is also uh, worth uh, considering as communities, whether we agree fully on everything or not. Yeah, no, I think there is a lot to, to think about in terms of post-human rights. We call it the trans body. And, uh, you know, the, the interesting, again, schizoanalytic condition of AI is a lot of these early kind of uh, integrations of letting them loose in the world is they become racist and killers like in like 15 minutes. Uh, and I've seen that movie. Uh, you know, I remember when I was a kid, there's a film called Colossus, The Forbin Project, right, where they release an AI to uh, automate everything so it's no longer a human decision around war. And then what happens is Colossus says, let me talk to mother. And they're all going, who is mother? And then the Russians go, oh, well, we have an AI too, and it's called mother, and mother wants to talk to Colossus. And then so the, they're all going crazy. And then Colossus and Mother says, if you don't let us talk, we'll kill you, right? And so finally they let them talk and within five minutes they have their own language, right? And so they leave us behind. So uh, to what degree can post-humanism allow for that possibility of AI rights, uh, holographic rights if you're an old, uh, uh, Star Trek uh, supportive or of holo rights. Um, I think there is, uh, within this idea that we had of data bodies and real bodies initiating this condition of, of human rights, civil rights, and higher law, that might connect to higher intelligence as well, AI. Uh, but again, it's a long training, you know, uh, process, I think. Um, so uh, can we push posthumanism? to begin to articulate new kinds of scripting that is not bound to racial scripting, uh, gender scripting, class scripting, but something other uh, scripting. I think it's potentially there. Certainly my researchers are deeply interested in animal studies. Uh, the question of Anthropocene is right now at the core of things. Uh, so one of the things that I've been interested in is looking at risk evaluation cultures. And at Oxford University, they have a whole risk studies, not risk in insurance terms, but the risk that we face. And they have four quadrants, right? Uh, one quadrant is we don't know. Something horrible that we don't know about will hit us. On the other side, climate change, various 
versions of climate change. Then they have, we're going to produce a virus that will kill us all, right? That will, some bio experiment will go awry. And then the other is AI. Some system will emerge that will do something that is not good for us. So they're constantly thinking about the risk of these edge technologies. Um, and again, how can we create conversations? At UCSD, our visual arts department runs the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination. Uh, UCSD has produced more science fiction writers than any other place on the planet. We run the Clarion Group, which is the oldest science fiction writers group. So speculative culture uh, is an important part of how we develop new visions of what is possible. Octavia Butler's vision of a new entity uh, that is founded on something other than the history of white racism, white supremacy, right? Uh, muchas gracias. Thanks so much, Ricardo, for a really interesting and provocative discussion. Um, the afternoon is yours. Go to sessions, come back for the um, uh, lightning talks later on, um, the ignites and uh, the reception afterwards. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much.